Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast, uh, some brand new video interviews that are happening here specifically for uh, YouTube. So I want to thank um, Vincent Ward of Vitalizer Drums and uh, at Junk Rock in Westchester, Pennsylvania for joining me today. Vincent, welcome. Hey, thanks, Bart. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad you're my uh, guinea pig for this because um, I got to, you know, this is the first one, so I'm probably going to enhance my background a little bit as time goes on and uh, fix some bugs. But um, as I mentioned, I want to put things up on YouTube because there's a really great community on YouTube and some awesome uh, video creators like John DeChristopher. I always see his and think, man, he's just doing such an awesome job and it looks great. So uh, I figured why not do it? And uh, you and I have known each other for you know a number of years now, and you were a really early guest on the podcast talking about um, Speed King pedals, which yeah. I still get comments saying, oh, man, I love that episode. So um, so yeah, again, thank you for uh, coming on and, and letting me test things out with you. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks for the episode. And um, I, I get a lot of people who have heard the episode and then they, they come to me and it's sort of um, it gives them a lot of the information that that they need to know. It gets people interested in it. Um, started doing speed kings in 2014 so it's been it's been wow. quite a while now um but yeah vitalizer uh over the past couple of years um ludwig reissued the speed king mm -hmm. at they announced it at the beginning of 2020 and they kind of landed um a little bit later that year so once that happened i immediately started figuring out how to pivot because I, yeah. I realized, you know, the market's going to get flooded with these new Speed Kings and it's really going to, the business can't be that narrow anymore. Yeah. So I started restoring other stuff, other pedals, other hardware, and I started looking for, you know, somewhere to land, basically. Yeah. So in the process of when, when Vitalizer was, was going full steam, I would travel to all these drum shows. I would buy every Speed King in the room, literally. I mean, I rarely left one behind. Um, because that started to become the only cost effective way to get them. Um, as speed Kings became more popular and Ludwig put a lot of money into advertising in 2020 and, mm -hmm. and got a lot of people thinking, Oh, Hey, I really used to like that pedal or I used to have one. I want to get one again. And some of that business came to me because the time period from when they announced it to when they actually landed was, um, a long time, like eight months or more. Mm. So it became a lot harder to get Speed Kings at a reasonable price online. Um, but in the process of traveling to these shows, I started to meet people. Uh, when I was traveling, I would always stop by whatever drum shop was there. And uh, one of the drum shops that I, I started visiting was Junk Rock in Westchester, Pennsylvania. And Junk Rock was started by Michael Windish. Um, his main business is um, live entertainment production. It, so mm -hmm. basically, um, hiring and training musicians for, for different things like uh, cruise ships, theme parks, stuff like that. So during the pandemic, it kind of came to a halt. And um, he, he, he kind of didn't really know what to do. So being a drummer first, he, he used to, uh, he's an excellent drummer. He, he used to tour with uh, Chubby Checker. Um, cool. So he, he can really play. And he, he basically started selling off some of his own stuff and uh, because his other business was on on pause, it really kind of evolved into a, a hobby and then a business. And um, he kind of just fell into the rabbit hole, as as a lot of people do when they get into vintage drums. You know, you start learning about things, you start meeting people, and it's just incredibly fascinating. So, yeah, when I first met him a couple years ago, it was basically it was th in this building. Um, so behind me now is the main showroom. We're kind of you can see there's a lot of stuff in here, but we're it, it's being transitioned into a, a, a proper drum shop. Um, and uh, hmm. it was basically just a big room full of stuff. And, I, and, you know, people would dig through and find things. And, um, yeah, after talking to him, you know, as the pandemic started to uh, loosen its, its hold on on the United States, um, his other business started back up and he needed somebody to come here and basically be a shop manager, I guess it would be called, but doing all the different aspects. And with my background in restoration, um, it just, it was, it was very serendipitous because um, yeah. I needed to pivot anyway. So Vitalizer still exists, 
Uh, it's currently on hiatus just because I, I can't spread myself too thin. Sure. But um, eventually Vitalizer will exist here in this building and Vitalizer will now be restoring everything. So everything that comes in the building is going to get the same type of um, process that was developed with Vitalizer, you know, really yeah. diving into things and not just restoring them or flipping them, getting them ready to sell, but really looking into the history of it, the information, what can be gathered, looking at the date stamps, what are the anomalies, yeah. you know, with Ludwig, yeah. especially when stuff comes in, you're constantly learning something. You could, you could be, um, dealing with these these drums for years and all of a sudden something comes in that challenges what you thought things yeah, were really yeah so it, that's it, what it's, i've it's found very with, interesting with doing a lot of these episodes is things almost i don't want to say contradict themselves sometimes but that happens where you think one thing and then someone else says another thing and they can both be correct more or less um and that's awesome i i can't think of a better person um than you to be in that role um I'm sure he trusts you completely because you know your stuff um, and Vitalizer. It's just like, I mean, you're you're a, a young guy and to have created a business that did well. And now you're smart enough to kind of transition and and, and uh, see what's happening and then now work with a shop. I think it makes a lot of sense. And and one thing you said before about going to the drum shows and stopping and buying pedals, I remember um, going to the, the first Chicago show I went to, which I think was in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, where we shared a booth, um, and just hearing your process of, oh yeah, I drove whatever, 12 or 14 hours to get here. And then I'm stopping along the way at drum shops and it turns into like a pilgrimage. I mean, you, yeah. you, you, you collect things. You're like, oh, and then I'm going on the way back. I'm going to stop at like Steve Maxwell's and pick up things there. It like coming from being just a drummer and not really being in this world of like, um, you know, drum nuts, basically, who are obsessed with it, uh, which I now very much am. Um, it was just so cool because a lot of people do that where they take a van and they hit shops along the way and they they pick things up to take back to their shops or or, or for you like Speed Kings or 5000s. Um, it just really was eye opening to see that. And what a fun way to do things. But obviously, as things changed, it's nice that you found a, a shop kind of home base, which looking behind you, it looks it looks awesome. It looks like you guys have some great uh, equipment available. Yeah, this is just the this is just one area. Uh, off of this room, there's there's two other rooms. There's a second floor, and then there's a third floor too, and it's yeah. all filled with drums. Um, so this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of stuff here it, to to restore. But um, yeah, going back to what you're saying about traveling to the shows, it's it's really it's very easy to justify if you're also a collector. Because you're, um, if it was just business and just money, I feel like it would, it would really lessen the appeal of it. But some of the moments of purest joy are walking into a shop and just seeing something and knowing, wow, that is so incredibly rare and I'm going to try to buy it. And then you get it. Um, one time that the, my best example and memory of that is going into Al Drews, which is in um, somewhere in Rhode Island. Um, in Rhode Island, it's beautiful. You get to see the country too, you know. Yeah. So Rhode Island in the fall, I think this was for the uh, Pennsylvania show run by Jack Lawton. And I, I walked in there and I'm looking around in, the, in that room. It's it's a big, long room. It's just full of stuff. And um, I saw just a, a shelf full of pedals and it was, it was you know, I knew that right away there were several things I was interested in for my personal collection and then just sitting kind of by itself um, was this pedal. And it, it was a 1942, what they what um, Steve Zeminet calls like the skeleton footboard. Mm -hmm. um, no one really knows. He and I have slightly different opinions about the origin of it. But there it was sitting there. And it was um, a skeleton footboard Speedmaster, which I did not even know existed. But there it was sitting in front of me. And... Um, yeah, I just took it over wow. to him. He, he was in his office shooting the shit with his buddies. And I was like, hey, how much do you want for this? And he was like, a hundred bucks. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't, because, you know, that was the first time I met him. People's first impression of you matters. Yeah. You know, if he, if he didn't like me, he would have said, ah, it's not for sale. Yeah. Yeah. But he, he just said, he just threw out a number and I was like, cool. And then I got three other pedals. Um, 
and yeah, on, on the way back, you know, I wasn't, I was excited about the speed Kings I picked up on that trip and the, and the, the people I met and the networking, but I was really excited about that pedal and putting it next to my other one and seeing the differences and, um, sure. Yeah. yeah that's, um, I mean, just that the, it, the hunt is so, and you, you're doing it obviously for a profession, but we all have that where if you're looking on, I don't know, it's like midnight and you're just kind of looking through like Facebook marketplace or something. And you just like are kind of, oh my God, <laughs> like, but like there, there's something special. It, it just like, is this like rush that like is so it's addicting. I mean, you want to just keep looking for stuff and it's even more so when you like you're doing, when you hit the road and you get in shops and you walk through and you find stuff but let me ask you this though. So, so when you're kind of doing your hunt, like on the way to a drum show, a drum show, do you also maybe look on Craigslist or are you stopping at garage sales ever or thrift shops? I mean, I, I realize it's harder to find stuff there, but then it's like, it's more, I don't want to say pure, but it's not been already found by another drummer. Do you like doing that sort of stuff too? I'm, I'm kind of odd in that aspect where I actually don't even look anymore online hmm. for anything. Um, certain things that I'm looking for, like another th thing that I started getting into, um, vintage symbols. I found one a couple years ago and it was, it was, you know, when you're collecting old Zildjian specifically, they do not all sound good. You could take five of them and line them up and, and, you know, one's average, two sound bad. One is okay, a little better. And then yeah. one is like, <laughs> you know, when you do that first, the first, yeah. and you know, I found one of those symbols and then every other, I tried to build a set around it. Um, and I wanted to get rid of my modern symbols, which were, um, Istanbul egg ops and, you know, have all old Zildjian's. And I looked and looked and looked. And th that's another funny thing about searching for something. You could say, wow, this must be so rare. I've been looking for a year and a half, two years. I haven't found one. All of a sudden here it is. And then all of a sudden a week later, oh, well, here's another one. So yeah. <laughs> I kind of, um, I started getting a lot of symbols and what I like to do is a, a, B stuff. So you put them right next to each other and, um, to find a yeah. full set that sounds good together is, is quite challenging for old symbols because there's a lot of, um, variance between them. And, um, yeah, so I do still look for, I like 24 inch and larger old Zildjian's. That's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for. And uh, trans stamp is the era that everyone loves. That's like mid, uh, early to mid forties to early to mid fifties, and that's kind of the last era where they were made by hand. So they've really yeah. got a special sound to them. It's much different than the eras afterwards, which are hollow block and then late fifties, and then they get by the time you get into the sixties, they're they're much more uniform sounding. You know, now you're in the Ringo era, and everything is streamlined. Yeah. There's no, there's no longer, there can't be a person there anymore. Who's, um, you know, taking the time to, to hand hammer something. Everything sure. needs to be a lot, a lot more streamlined. Yeah. Just so, by the, sh the, the sheer nature of mass production and meeting supply and demand, it just kind of makes sense. So it's a special thing to get those earlier. Um, I also wanted to just, there's, cause there's some avid Camco collectors out there and I know you have, uh, a beautiful Camco set, or at least you did last time we were talking. I know that's kind of your baby. Um, talk about that a little bit. I got four now. <laughs> wow. Okay. So talk about Camco for a little bit. Uh, Camco is incredibly rare. Uh, there just is not nearly as many of them as as other brands. Um, so I, of the four that I have, one of them I'm probably going to get rid of it because it's more of like a player's set. It'd be perfect for somebody who actually wants to be able to lug their Camcos around and play them. And I just don't play music with other people. I don't rehearse. I don't gig. So it, it feels like it should be passed on. And I, I have a friend who's interested in it, um, who, who I'll, I'll probably, I mean, he, he just started looking for Camco, but he's, he's in the business of, of finding drums. So he's in the time period that we've been talking about, he's found like three other sets. So wow. you, can you can find them if you're looking for them. Um, they're just really well made. They, they sound really good. And, um, Hmm. I have, I have my, my two main sets, you know, they're, they're lifers. I, I would, I'll, I'm holding on to those for the, for the long haul, but yeah, a, as a younger collector and w for younger, I, uh, in vintage drums, like 
consider that anyone is un- under the age of 45, basically. Uh, you're considered a young, a young guy if you're under 45. Uh, yeah, you have to be pretty strategic about it. Um, so th- there's not a, a lot of supply of some of these certain things. The things that I like, they're really rare. So I still look on Reverb and eBay for, mm-hmm. for the big symbols because they just don't come up that often. Most of the time when I find something, a shop has already gotten it and I end up paying yeah. you know full retail for it, which yeah. is fine because I'm not in the business of buying these things and reselling them. I'm buying them for personal use. I don't personally care if they go up or down in value. Um, I don't like paying a lot more than retail. That's kind of like a, a, a limitation I've put on myself. Just, it, it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel good to pay yeah. more than what something's worth. But a lot of times it, it ends up being like that. It's either in the hands of a collector who has overvalued it or they overpaid for it or, um, Whatever the circumstances are, it's just um, sure they're just extremely expensive. But yeah, I'm I'm really happy with the stuff I have now. As far as my pedal collection, um, I did stop looking online for them because that's a very slippery slope. You know, you end up getting a lot of stuff and you pay a lot of money for it. I'm to the point with the pedal collection where I am only adding things that I find organically. So when I'm traveling or now working at, at Junk Rock this stuff just comes in, in the door, you know, many yeah. times per week. Um, Windish will, will come back and I'll have a car load full of stuff that comes in and we'll look through it and see, you know, what's, you know, what the stuff is and evaluate it and in there. So th- this is a perfect mm-hmm. example. This is a, a Ludwig junior with a Very leading nice. eater. Yeah. Um, this is something that just came in with a bunch of other stuff and it, you probably won't be able to tell, but it has like a homemade repair where yeah. the, with like a little wire. Interesting. I, I love this stuff. This is yeah. an incredibly common pedal, but it's so interesting to me that this guy had this pedal and he played it and um, actually mm. ended up re- replacing it later with a better pedal. But um, when this piece broke, he didn't go get a new pedal. He just took a piece of wire from something, maybe it's a paper clip, and just twisted it all up. And <laughs> the pedal the pedal works now. It works. He fixed, he fixed it. And that, yeah. that, to me, that to me is so incredibly fascinating. That's the kind of stuff that I want to collect and eventually display, um, you know, in, yeah. ca- in, in, in nice cabinets and stuff. And you can look at it and you remember maybe where you got it or um, absolutely a little story of, of, of why it's interesting. You know, it's, it's this yeah. to me is more interesting than finding one that's in very good condition because Perfect it tells shape. It tells yeah. a story. Yeah. What year well, is that one? Ooh, uh, probably ballpark. Th- probably thirties. Okay. Probably thirties. Um, it came with some other stuff that was um, a lot of the hardware was from the thirties, but the drums themselves were from the fifties. So it probably um, maybe the guy had a drum set and then he traded it in for a new newer model in the fifties, in the yeah. early fifties, but he kept all of his hardware for whatever is- reason smart we've all done that where it's like oh i'm gonna sell this drum set but i'm keeping the snare or i'm keeping the throne because you always you always need yeah. a throne <laughs> it, it is absolutely fascinating i've always i, I kind of knew once once i realized vitalizer wasn't going to be viable um for a lot longer i knew i wanted to land at a drum shop because it's it is so incredibly fascinating to see the stuff come in and we're in a, a special time period where in in 20 years it's not going to be like this where you're getting things from the original owners or the original owner's family and it's intact everything's going to be split up and 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 spread out so being able to document during this time period for someone like me is i mean the information is is incredibly valuable to me yeah opening up a trap case or yeah somebody's like um i i opened up a a little briefcase and in there this guy clearly played timpani was every single thing he brought to his his job as a as a timpanist or awesome. whatever it, it's called yeah. all of his mallets sheet music a little note that says this is not a table because people <laughs> i guess used to set stuff on his timpani yeah. he's like this is not a table don't put wow. your don't put your stuff on this um it's just a know, glimpse but, into his like yeah. his this guy's process i mean that's just unbelievable absolutely fascinating to to see this stuff and um yeah. So yeah, yeah, I've gotten a, a little, a little experience with that already, and 
stuff like that will continue to come in. And um, it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, one thing that that comes to mind, too, and and I I spoke about it recently on um, the episode with Terry Keating, which I want to say thank you to Terry for sending me this bonds. Oh, that's awesome. This mug, which I think he sells them on his uh, website or through um, YouTube because people asked about that. So there you go. But I was talking to Terry about um, the younger generation of people and how impressed I am, which with with the amount of knowledge that people such as yourself have. And actually, when I talked about him. I was referring in my mind to you about, you know, a 35 year old guy has so much information about vintage drums and it's not just you. It's a lot of people uh, of, of all ages, but it's the amount of information that can be retained and 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 about every single little item I think is only possible if you're super passionate about something like you're it's like, you know, in, yeah. in school. I hated math. I'm not really I wasn't really good at it. I didn't retain, you know, I can obviously do basic math, but or French. I was taking French in school. I can't speak a word of it. I took it for like 13 years. <laughs> it's like um, it. The passion, I think, leads to this sponge like uh, absorbing of information, which like just you can you can walk into a room and know everything and going to these drum shows, I think, is like a candy store for guys like you guys like me and girls everyone where you just you don't see all this stuff uh at at any one drum shop which kind of leads into the discussion of um of drum shows which I'll speak a little bit about me cuz I know we we kind of have a couple bullet points we want to try and talk about and I just want to say that me entering this scene in 2018 um with with no real like I mean obviously I'm a longtime drummer but no real background in going to shows and collecting beyond you know buying a Ludwig set here and there um, was so welcoming and inviting just right off the bat uh, even before going to a show just through the internet which we all you know are lucky to live in a, an era where we can uh, just talk to each other like this or check out what a shop has from our couch. Um, but the drum shows in general, uh, I think the best thing I ever did is go to the Chicago show in 2018, where um, you again were just like, hey, you want to join my booth? And I was like, yes. And I think it was uh, mutually beneficial, I hope, because, uh, you know, I had some listeners on the podcast. You had an actual physical reason to have a booth, <laughs> which I really didn't. Um, so that was just great. But just everyone is so welcoming and inviting. And, and I'll be totally honest that it's a little intimidating at first. Like yeah. walking in the door to any show, I'm still pretty new at this going. I've only been to, you know, five or six real shows. Um, it's still a little nerve nerve wracking to be like, you know, I don't know everything there is to know about vintage drums. I've learned a lot over 100, whatever, 40 episodes. But um, everyone is very, very inviting. I do think, which I think is a good thing. You still need to earn your stripes a little bit. So day one, you need to like kind of like show that you're passionate and uh, like authentic because people don't just rush up to you and go, welcome, come on in. It's still a little bit of like, who's this guy? What's he doing in a nice way? But you still need to kind of maybe year one, you don't get invited to the dinners or whatever, you know, but as time goes on and as you put yourself out there, I have found very much for me that like people just accept you like with open arms. It has nothing to do with your playing ability it has nothing to do with your uh, collection that you have at home. Um, it's just all about your passion and just your, again, being authentic. People love that. And I think that's a great thing about the community. And um, so that being said, let's 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 talk about those drum shows a little bit more. It's 2022. It's January. The world is still a weird place. Yeah. What are you feeling about all this? What do you got coming up? I'm very excited for the Delaware Drum Show. I believe yep. that is February 27th. I have to have to double check that, but that's um Joe Joey Meckler's or Joey Boom, as some people call him. That's his show, and that's a show you want to be at. It, it, it epitomizes the the what you're talking about. There are people. There are a lot of people that go to that show who are not, you know, diehard members of of the community. They're they're people who are interested in drums. People who play drums. And they they like seeing the stuff. They're not necessarily there to buy things, but um, yeah, yeah. Everyone's everyone's there. Everyone's welcome. And um, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll be there. Um, 
Junk Rock's going to be there. Um, a, a lot of other other people. Um, you do need to bring some kind of uh, proof of, of vaccination. So there was a little bit of waves about that. But you know, Meckler's just doing what he yeah. he's doing what's best for the community, tr- trying to keep people safe. Because unfortunately, we've lost a lot of people in in the in the community. It's 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 like it's really tragic. Um, because you, you're talking about the idea of knowing everything or not knowing everything. The truth lies in between. You know what you know, and yeah. you don't know. You know. There's a lot that you don't know, and there there's certain things. No one is going to learn as much as I've learned about Speed Kings. No one's going to learn as much about World War II drums as Joe Meckler and, sure. uh, you know, Mark Cooper, the, the, the guys who have really taken an interest in that. So thankfully, a lot of this information has been recorded in books by Rob Cook and others, uh, people he's collaborated with and, and, and others. Um, Steve Zemanek, you know, wrote his book and yep. sorry, sorry, Steve, not everything in there is correct, <laughs> but, but <laughs> it's the best, it's the best that he could deduce. You're dealing with imperfect information sure. and, um, so yeah, yeah it's, it's the, the information needs to be passed on. If everyone who knows everything right now never tells anyone, never records it, then you can't build on that. It, it would have been so incredibly difficult for me to figure out vintage symbols, which is my current, you know, special interest. The first thing I did was check out the the amazing resources that are online that tell you all of this other stuff that people, and then I build off of that. And, yeah. um, always question everything you hear um especially with ludwig nothing is written in stone there's always exceptions to the rule and there's always a mystery to figure out but getting a a younger generation anyone who's interested don't be intimidated come to these shows ask questions um look up look up information do your own research find your own information and don't be afraid to be part of the community i i really sincerely hope that that what exists right now with vintage drums with a lot of people being interested and a lot of people um, caring about them and a lot of people playing them. I hope that exists forever. And I, I'm, I'm doing my part to, um, to perpetuate that working at a drum shop is a great opportunity to, to further that, that agenda, you know, you're yeah. taking in these items. A lot of them are broken. You're fixing them figuring out what they are, doing the research, and then you you add that value and then you present it to the community. So you're going to pay more at these drum shops, but they're doing a lot of the work for you. Of course, you can look and try to find your own things, but as time goes on, it's going to be the vintage drum shops that are your resource for information to get these items. And um, also, I, I know very few people who find exactly what they're looking for on the first try. If you want to yeah. try something out, sit down and play it, take it home, change your mind, <laughs> bring it back, trade it, and uh, find out some more information, a vintage drum shop is is where you want to be for that. Yeah, and that's that's a lot of the fun. And really, that that kind of rewinding a little bit to the show stuff, which I think leads directly into that, um, these shows are typically pretty regional, where... I know for me in Cincinnati, I can get to, I know there's, um, I mean, even going to the Music City Drum Show in Nashville, which we were both at last year, um, like there's typically one, I would say within a four hour drive of most people, unless you live in like Alaska or something. I mean, there's typically one that's like pretty, pretty regionally, you know, Chicago and Pennsylvania and St. Louis. So, um, and then you can go there and pick things up and try things and meet you know, from 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 coming in as an outsider years ago to now being kind of on the, I guess, the inside. I always feel weird saying that. It's You're cool to, <laughs> to be on the inside, to meet people who you see on social media is just sort of like uh, a cool thing, like Bryson Nelson or like you or Rob Cook or there's Steve Maxwell walking around or any of these guys. It's just like... Uh, it really makes it more real because we're all real people. And then then you can actually pick up the gear there and say, what's the story with this? And I think yep. I think people like sellers, uh, collectors really enjoy, in my opinion, when someone is curious and um, very nice about it instead of saying picking it up and going, oh, this is this and saying something that might be wrong. 
asking questions and um and being really kind of happy and and let's talk about it especially i remember with if you go and check out joey boom's setup he's going he's it's great he'll tell you everything you want to know about it um so that's just another great thing about those shops and or i should say shows and shops is you can just go in and pick things up and put your hands on it and learn and maybe you don't need to spend two thousand dollars on a drum set but you can still touch it and feel it and learn about it and Oh, okay. These lugs look like this, and this is this hardware. Um, yeah. So it's just a really cool thing to to get out there and um, and and do the do the shows. Um, so now now where will you be this year uh, that we can all kind of look for Vincent? Delaware for sure. Chicago for sure. Um, you'll see a lot more shows popping up once the uh, once the pandemic and who who knows how long it's yeah. actually going to last. But right before the pandemic hit, there was supposed to be. A Las Vegas show. There was a New England show that that Don McCauley was going to do, yep. and and um, Jack Lawton. He he just kind of he stopped. Um, you know, he said basically until the pandemic is in a in a better place. I'm not doing the Pennsylvania show anymore. So if that, I go to any show that exists. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, I mean, up to Chicago. I'm not going to travel across the country usually, but um. The shows are awesome. You know, that first year in 2018, you know, I was on the outside too. No one knew who I was. I was sitting there at the booth and and uh, John Aldridge came up and I was like, oh my God, that's John Aldridge. <laughs> yeah. And uh, at the time, you, you know, you weren't as well known either. But at the Music City show, when we were talking, you know, you've got a very, a very distinctive, uh, loud, uh, you know, voice that people have heard for hours and hours. So sure. just us talking you know, casually, you would see people look over at you. They would hear your voice and recognize it and say, oh, you know, that's that's the Bart. That's Bart. That's the drum history guy. And that is, oh, that awesome. is so cool. That's like, that makes me so happy to, to see, you know, again, people who are younger that are coming in here and picking up the torch, asking questions. Y- your podcast, I feel like it, it was, it's the biggest thing for helping people with that. And um, being Thank on you. YouTube, I think it's going to help it even more. You're, you're getting a different, a, a younger audience. You know, the next thing sure. is uh, tic- TikTok, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to start <laughs> dancing on TikTok uh, to well, get that. <laughs> no, no, but like, like, you know, Instagram just introduced these reels or whatever. That, totally. You have to, you, a lot of people are not going to come to these shows, especially with COVID. You know, people, a lot of people are just, they're not going to come to these shows anymore. And um in, in, until that is in, in a better place, but um, yeah, yeah, you, you, it has to be at a source where people can actually access it. You know, yeah. YouTube, podcasts, social media, and get those gears turning. People, well, what is the big deal about vintage drums? How are they different than my Mapex set? Oh, okay, here's how they're different. Um, maybe yeah. I am inter- interested in this. Maybe they start looking, start asking questions. Yeah, and then yeah, it's take it's it from all, there. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to say too, thank you very much about what you said. But so uh, obviously, people are probably watching this on YouTube, um, and it's an interesting thing because a lot of people watch. I put up a still image, and they'll watch the podcast, which is just a still image for an hour or whatever. Um, and just so people know that, like the primary listenership of the podcast is on like Spotify and Apple, um, where you can download it on your phone and all this stuff. But I realized that a lot of people do listen slash watch these still image, just kind of a, a, you know, an hour of one image so they can see it on um, YouTube. But if you want, you can also listen on your phone. You can search for drum history anywhere. That's just kind of a thing where I found people on YouTube maybe didn't know that, that it is actually just like on on um, Stitcher and these podcast platforms. But my goal here with YouTube is to share more videos because I am a YouTube like I know I think you 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 are too Vincent where I watch it like every night like I treat it almost like like sometimes you're like Netflix and Hulu it's just like I get sick of it and I just want to go to YouTube and watch videos of like um you know computer reviews or like uh anything sure. just a- ran- anything anything even things I watch videos on um sports card collecting I don't have any any <laughs> sports cards I love getting a window into another collecting community. It's the same thing. Sure. They have show, they have shows and things like that. Uh, I watch it on video game collecting. I, I don't, yep. I mean, I have some retro video games now because that's a perfect example. I, I watched, I was like, why do people collect these? You can just get an emulator or whatever. Or, and then after, you know, meeting some people and, and watching some of these videos, like, well, 
I want to go into the attic and dig out my old stuff. And, and then I ended up getting some new stuff. And I even went to a show with uh, my neighbor who's super into video game collecting. So it, it's cool. That's the process for getting people interested in these things in these communities. So yeah, I, I, yeah. I, com- I commend your effort and I, I really, I really hope to see, see that continue. Absolutely. Um, and uh, why don't we, as we wrap up here, first off, I want to say thank you to everyone for watching this and for listening. Again, if you want a, a new episodes of the podcast come out every Tuesday, um, I release them Monday night at midnight Eastern Standard, which I've, you know, there's people all over the world, so there's different time zones. Um, but uh, you can listen there. Um, there's some new merch that I just put up for Drum History, where if you go to the website and click the shop button, it's through T Public, which is which is one of those sites where like they make it, they ship it. I get so this is kind of funny. I get a dollar, like if you buy a T shirt, I get one dollar, um, which is not great. But uh, it's better to have shirts and mugs and pillows. And if you want a Drum History laptop case, go ahead and buy it. It's on there. Um, so I'm kind of trying that out. Um, but that being said, uh, I hope to do more of these videos. Um, oh, and about s- merch. Before I forget, I'm going to say thank you to Jose from um, Revival Drum Shop in Portland. He just sent me a bunch of awesome swag because I think he's really enjoying the podcast. And he also sent, this is just how nice of a guy he is. He sent two of everything so my wife could have some. Like he sent her a sweatshirt. He sent her a pink shirt with the Revival logo. He sent uh, sticks, a book, a low boy beater um stickers a sizzler wow. i mean just an awesome just beyond nice package so thank you to jose at revival um i can't wait to hopefully make it out to portland and check out the shop but um me too yeah so yeah that's that's going further away than chicago than your line so you got to make it out that way and go more uh to the west and <laughs> Although, I, I mean it, it becomes like a like a pilgrimage um i mean i will for sure go there one day uh, yeah. Jose Jose's got a really wonderful brand, a really wonderful business that he's he's built there. And um, yeah, I'll definitely visit. Definitely yeah. visit someday. Totally. All right. So, Vincent, as we're like finishing up here, why don't you say where people can find you and junk rock and promote that kind of stuff? And then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. So uh, the website still exists for Vitalizer. It's Vitalizer Drum. No S on there uh, dot com. And um, I'm here at, at Junk Rock, um, so this will be the source for for getting for getting things as time moves forward. Um, you're welcome to come by, and um, phone is the best way. Uh, if you go to the website, you'll find my phone number, and that is that is the best way to contact me now. Um, yeah, that's sure. That's that's it. That's cool. That's great. And you're in Westchester, Pennsylvania, um, which is pretty close to New York. I, I used to live in Scranton, Pennsylvania, um, home of the office. So I'm sort of nice familiar with Pennsylvania but um okay Vincent thank you again for taking the time to um to do this and thanks again for everyone on YouTube for subscribing I feel like I have to say that because I'm a YouTuber now uh yeah. remember to subscribe Sma- smash that like button smash the like button leave a comment um tell us about your collection maybe like things that yeah. you're collecting I think that's really cool maybe maybe what's your specific thing that you like like vincent has he's going in pedals now he's going in cymbals what are some things that you guys uh are enjoying and um and we'll go from there and like i said this is the guinea pig first episode so things will get cleaner i'm in a this is you know where i record the podcast is the third floor of my house which is like sort of unfinished um but things will get cleaner and better as i go so uh thanks everyone for watching and thank yeah. you, Vincent, for being here. Yep. I wanted to dedicate this this first episode to some of my friends that have been lost in the last couple of years. Um, sure. Neil Longo, he made solid shell drums. Wonderful person. He was always at these shows. It's where I met him. Um, he passed in the last year. And um, this is super recent. Mr. Sticks, all, his real name is John Marr. And um, man, really, really tragic. I really... I love seeing him at these shows, Connecticut and Delaware, just a wonderful person, such a, such a great energy to him. So he's yeah. passed in, in the last week and just say, rest in peace. It was wonderful to get to, to meet these guys. And, um, you know, it's, yeah. there's still, there's still plenty of, plenty of people from, from that era who are coming to these shows, sharing their information and, um, you know, get out there and, and meet these guys. 
That's great. What a good way to end this episode. I appreciate it, Vincent. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks, Bart.